Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancing. Tonight, the government bans hundreds of firearms. Canadians deserve more than thoughts and prayers. We'll look at the justification and the timing. They're using this pandemic uh, as a way to, to bring in a major policy decision. What the policy means for gun owners. It never, never happened. Joe Biden denies a sexual assault accusation. The person applied and shouldn't have. The potential risk of taking emergency funds not meant for you. And honoring the Canadians on a crashed military helicopter. We will always remember them. Off the coast of Greece, it's now a recovery mission. This is The National. 13 days after the Nova Scotia mass shooting began, the government says the market for what it describes as military-grade assault-style guns has closed. These weapons were designed for one purpose and one purpose only, to kill the largest number of people in the shortest amount of time. There is no use and no place for such weapons in Canada. In announcing the immediate ban of 1,500 types of firearms, the Prime Minister cited Canada's worst mass shootings, the Polytechnique massacre, the murders in Mayor Thorpe, Alberta, and Moncton, New Brunswick, and the horrific rampage in Nova Scotia, still so fresh in the minds of Canadians. But the opposition says the policy doesn't deal with the real problem. Salima Shivji has the details. We remember how our sense of safety was shaken. Evoking painful memories, the Prime Minister says enough is enough. Not yet two weeks after Canada's worst ever mass shooting killed 22 people. Their families deserve more than thoughts and prayers. Canadians deserve more than thoughts and prayers. The timing opportune, the Liberals hope, for a ban long talked about. These guns make it easier to commit mass murder. On the list, 1,500 types and their variants of assault-style guns. As of today, restricted and no longer sold. If you own one, you can keep it for now, but can't use it. Firearms like the one that took 14 lives in the Polytechnic massacre and two that officials say the gunman in the Nova Scotia mass shooting used just days ago. But those two were obtained illegally, raising questions on whether this ban would have made a difference. What the government calls a sweeping gun control measure completely misses the point, says the opposition. Going after people who traffic in firearms, who smuggle in firearms, who illegally modify firearms, that is what will actually save lives in the country. And what the Liberals are doing is, uh, is just symbolism over substance. And what wasn't said here, but quietly later, there will be an option for gun owners to have their weapons grandfathered, applying to keep them instead of selling them back to the government. A bitter pill for survivors of gun violence. If you're offering grandfather clauses, uh, I'm sure that means that, you know, many, if not most, gun owners will be able to keep their assault weapons. And so the Liberals are walking a fine line in a highly polarized debate, keeping but softening a long-standing promise and repeating that details on legislation for the gun buyback program are yet to be worked out. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. The search for the Canadian military helicopter that crashed in the Mediterranean has gone from a rescue mission to one of recovery. The five who are missing now presumed dead. Kayla Hounsell looks at what we're learning about them and the investigation. At 12 Wing Shearwater, where the members of the air crew were based, there is a growing memorial today to match the growing grief. And on board HMCS Fredericton in the Mediterranean, a vigil for those lost at sea. This decision was not taken lightly. The commander of Maritime Forces Atlantic says despite the efforts of Canadian and Allied forces, time has run out. We are certain that if there were survivors, we would have found them within the past 48 hours. The body of Sub-Lieutenant Abigail Cobra was recovered when the Cyclone helicopter crashed Wednesday. Military officials say they have now found other remains, but have not been able to identify them. That likely won't happen until they are repatriated to Canada next week. These proud military members died heroes, and we will always remember them. Captain Brendan MacDonald was a proud father and a house full of boys. Captain Maxime Mirin Morin aspired to serve in the Canadian Armed Forces since he was a cadet as a teenager. 
and Master Corporal Matthew Cousins was an outstanding aviator who kept the officers on, of his crew in line and focused on the mission. Sub-Lieutenant Matthew Pike, a Naval Warfare officer, is also presumed dead, and Captain Kevin Hagen, whose father says he was caring and sensitive. Telling the world how proud I am of Kevin doesn't even begin to scratch the surface for those feelings of admiration I have always felt for him. HMCS Fredericton is now headed for Italy. The ship will be met by a team of Canadians, chaplains, social workers, and investigators. The cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder have been found along with a helicopter door and pieces of the fuselage. Clues to help investigators determine what went so catastrophically wrong. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Emergency evacuation orders were lifted in some parts of Fort McMurray, Alberta today, but not for all 13,000 people out of their homes. Only some neighborhoods have been allowed to reopen so far, like this one, where floodwaters have receded enough. But while people in some downtown areas are relieved to go home, now comes the difficult task of dealing with the damage left behind. Rafi Bujikanian has that story. If you look in front, there's a shorter green building with the red and black lettering. Well, that's her sign. That's her Mr. Mike's. For almost a week, this is as close as Mike DeRoche got to his restaurant. With a public health pandemic, the business already wasn't doing well. Just sort of surviving, doing takeout and deliveries. Then the flood hit, displacing him from his business and thousands from their homes. We have spoiling foods on the line and our coolers and our freezers all has to be taken out and replaced. Until this afternoon, he had no idea what else to expect. Then officials announced this. But to be clear, conditions are improving and we're beginning to turn the corner from response to recovery. They led a limited number of people back into the downtown core. deroshi has got some rotten food to get rid of, but he's counting his blessings as the building is dry. Not everyone's been so lucky. Some residents taking stock of what they still have and what they can't get back. Uh, I'm nervous now because you know why I lost everything and then I don't know what I do. Yana Yakazu's basement was completely submerged, everything ruined. She says she didn't have time to grab anything, just her family. Only my son and then my cousin and then all people because uh, police you take care of us go out fast because water is coming fast. The province is encouraging people to talk to their insurance companies and also to take advantage of a government emergency fund. But there is assistance coming. Disaster recovery programs are intended for exactly this type of situation. But with no sense of exactly when everyone will be able to come home and more than a thousand buildings so far known to be damaged, repairs will be costly and the recovery will be long. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Fort McMurray. Alberta is also grappling with Canada's largest outbreak of COVID-19 at a huge workplace set to reopen on Monday, unless the union there can stop it. The Cargill meat processing plant is a big part of the food supply. 2,000 employees process 4,500 head of cattle every day. But rampant infections forced a shutdown nearly two weeks ago. More than 900 workers have now tested positive, and the plant is linked to nearly 1,500 cases. A worker in her 60s died. Carolyn Dunn shows us that some are afraid to go back in. We have received some information that you might have had an exposure to somebody who had previously tested positive for... Third-year medical student Erin Kelly spends her days reaching out to people who may have been in contact with an infected person. The enormous outbreak at the Cargill meat processing plant helps keep them busy. While some people know the call is coming... Other people aren't really expecting it at all and are, can be quite freaked out when we call them. So a big part of our job is providing reassurance. But as Cargill gears up to reopen the massive plant, many workers are far from reassured. It's so scary to go into work every day wondering, am I going to contract this virus? And when I contract this virus, will I die from it? And what's going to happen to my family if I die? We're calling this worker Rachel and hiding her identity because she fears losing her job for speaking out. She doesn't trust the reopening because even after the outbreak started, she says, 
public health protocols were not being followed. Terrified, absolutely terrified. Everybody was coming in, they're asking everybody a million questions. The plant will open slowly, one shift a day to begin. And Cargill says it has enhanced safety measures inside the plant, as well as getting workers to and from work safely. Alberta Premier uh, Jason Kenney says the reopening will happen under strict possible, oversight. We simply cannot shut down every food processing plant in Alberta or in Canada uh, because that would create an obvious uh, uh, crisis in terms of food security. But the union representing Cargill workers hopes to do just that. It's seeking a stop work order and an emergency hearing this weekend to prevent the plant from opening as scheduled. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, High River, Alberta. Now to some other people who fear about their safety on the job and also the health of the people they tend to. Nearly a million Canadians rely on home care workers. Ellen Morrow shows us the calculated risk some of those workers now grudgingly accept. This is what we're supplied with. Every day on the job, this personal support worker visits up to 10 clients in their homes. We are to take our surgical masks, service a client, come back to our cars, take the surgical mask off, place it in the brown paper bag and leave it there till we get to our next client. Jody Fenlong Verberg works for Care Partners, a private agency providing home care across Ontario. In an email obtained by CBC News, Care Partners tells workers to use that same mask they start the day with until they are done all their visits, with some exceptions, and carry that mask carefully from home to home in a paper bag. How is wearing one mask for every client with a brown paper bag for help suffice for proper PPE. He's admitted by Dr. Singh. In normal times, it never would, but in the pandemic, it's becoming more common. Even as Ontario Premier Doug Ford maintains, there's enough PPE to go around. If uh, the caregivers need masks, Give them the mask. But Care Partners isn't alone. Even some hospitals are now reusing masks. We have to do what we have to do so that if anything changes with the pandemic, we won't be left with a situation where, where healthcare workers are wearing nothing. Earlier this week, Ontario lost another care worker to COVID-19, 51-year-old Arlene Reed. She, she was just a, a rock. Reed's children said their mother worried about not having enough protective gear, but went to work anyway. A hero, they say, and a devastating loss. I'm just trying to figure out where do I go from here and how do I live without my mom and what do we do? While other care workers fear their own vulnerability. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Saskatchewan has a spike in COVID-19 cases. 26 people have tested positive, 19 of them around the northern community of Laloche. Across Canada, there are more than 55,000 confirmed cases and more than 3,500 deaths, but also now more than 22,000 who have been sick and recovered. And that raises a question everyone wants answered. Once you've recovered, are you immune? Now, getting to the bottom of that is a key goal for researchers and health professionals. Vicka Dopey explains what's involved. Herb Knapp is leaving this COVID-19 unit. With the worst over, his recovery continues in another ward. The evidence so far shows the antibodies he developed to fight the illness means the risk of reinfection from the coronavirus for patients like him is low. In most cases, you would expect those antibodies to provide you with protection for a period of time. It is unknown what that period of time is, and it is unknown what the extent of protection is. And even less is known about people who test positive for those antibodies but never had any actual symptoms. Eventually, that could be more than half the population. The science isn't clear about how much protective immunity they have from reinfection. You know, the technical term for this is correlates of protection, um, which is, you know, what sort of level of, uh, of antibody do you need to be protected? How long does it last? Those are all uh, important research questions. Not having those answers hasn't discouraged the use of rapid antibody testing by labs and hospitals. They can give a quick snapshot of where we are in flattening the curve, but... 
would it give me the confidence that I scored positive on that test that I was now ready to um, queue up for a pint of beer in a crowded pub shoulder to shoulder with all the other people there? Not really, no. And that's frustrating for governments eager to get out of lockdown. Expanding antibody testing without understanding what those results, exposure and immunity all mean has risks. Herd immunity may be a very weak and fragile thing and we may all be sitting ducks waiting for reinfection. We'll only know for sure when streets fill up again and there's a second wave of outbreaks. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto. Albertans are being asked to download a new phone application aimed at tracking COVID cases across the province. Alberta Trace Together relies on the use of wireless Bluetooth technology to log interactions as an encrypted digital handshake. If someone with the free app tests positive, they'll be asked to voluntarily upload encrypted data, which can be used to reach contacts who may have been infected. Dr. Hinshaw says privacy will be protected. The province's privacy commissioner says the agency will be monitoring. The more we test, the more we find. We want to find positive cases. We want to investigate around those cases to go up the transmission chain. Quebec is pushing to aggressively ramp up its testing strategy, going from roughly 6,000 daily tests to 14,000 by the end of the week, end of next week. Starting Monday, people with symptoms will be able to call a number and be referred to a designated screening centre. An appointment should be made available within 24 hours. For people coming into Canada from abroad, the routine at airports these days is much different than it was a few weeks ago. That's just one part of this country's COVID-19 story. Here's Tanya Fletcher. He's there. He's somewhere in there. Just have to wait. Deanna McDonald hasn't seen her son in over a year. They're asking him for the phone number of my husband. They're asking for a postal code. He had her address, but I guess there's a couple things missing. So they're going through a full form and he needs to have everything on there. This is the detailed quarantine form all travellers now have to fill out. Specific questions about where they'll be staying and how they plan to get there. Thanks, Kelly. Roy and Donna Nichols had their daughters pick them up from the airport. As soon as they landed, they got strict quarantine instructions. They want to know uh, what your plans are, like how you're going to support yourself in the next two weeks. Yeah, and who's <laughs> going to get your groceries, who's going to get your medication and all that. And, and you could be fined up to a million dollars. Dollars, yeah. They made that quite clear. And they've been warned they'll get follow-up calls as well. More than 9,000 phone calls have been made so far, including one to Anna Koje. She and her partner are one week into their quarantine after flying back from New Zealand. We received a call from Service Canada after a few days, um, just checking in on us, making sure we're okay, making sure we had food and we were cleaning products and we weren't feeling it unwell at all. But the BC government says about 500 calls were not returned, so police were sent to their doorsteps. And so a local officer would knock on their door and say, hey, the province has been trying to get a hold of you. Um, you need to call them back. And what we found is overwhelmingly every one of those people responded back and engaged with the process. Over the past three weeks, 16,000 travelers have come into Canada through BC borders, but about 100 of them did not present proper self-isolation plans, so they were immediately whisked away and placed under government quarantine at various hotels across the province. Meanwhile, Deanna McDonald is eventually reunited with her son. A moment of togetherness in an age of isolation. I love you so much. You. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. And as COVID-19 ravages the Canadian economy, a changing of the guard at the Bank of Canada. Today, Tiff Macklem, who takes over next month, cautiously reassured Canadians better days are coming. The economy will uh, start to bounce back. This virus is going to be out there for some time, and the Bank of Canada will play its role Macklem is a longtime veteran of the bank and had been second in command for seven years. He replaces Stephen Polaz, whose term expires on June the 2nd. The switch is happening at a dicey time for Canada's economy and for millions of people suddenly out of work. The government's CERB program is meant to ease some of the pain. But as Catherine Cullen explains, some people seem to view it as an opportunity. As the financial pressure from the outbreak builds, millions have received the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, including some who shouldn't have. This is kind of just in its infancy right now. 
Credit counselor John Coburn says he was recently called to offer advice on one case. The person applied um, and shouldn't have. They didn't qualify. He says the man's caseworker found out about the benefit application and convinced him to give the money back, avoiding serious consequences. This person was a subsidized housing, was on a provincial disability uh, uh, pension, and all of that would have been affected. And he is not alone. One Canada Revenue Agency worker tells CBC News that every day she sees people receiving the benefit who shouldn't be eligible. She says it's everything from those who seem to have been coerced into applying by family members to some who appear to just want some quick cash. We've hidden her identity and had someone else read her words because she fears punishment for speaking publicly. When I quiz them about it, there's a variety of answers, from laughing in my face to trying to establish that there's some loophole. She also worries people don't understand that they'll have to pay taxes on the money later and could lose access to benefits. It could affect your housing. It could affect your social assistance payments. Checks have even been sent to jails, Radio Canada reports, but stopped by corrections officers. We knew the risk was there, but it was calculated, and we also knew we had to get the money to Canadians. The employment minister says she was aware this program would be easier to abuse, but she warns the government will be checking up on those who receive it. So we're going to cross-reference payments. We're going to be able to follow up on people if we hear, for example, that someone hasn't been truthful. She says she sympathizes with anyone feeling financially squeezed, but they shouldn't take the risk of being dishonest to get the benefit. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. For the first time, Joe Biden is directly addressing an allegation of sexual assault. It is not true. It never, never happened. Up next, the denial and the complications for his presidential campaign. And later, cooking at home with celebrity chefs. Cooking lessons in quarantine. Just what everybody needs, right? And a moment of gratitude and celebration after weeks in hospital. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> We're back in two. These pictures purport to show Kim Jong-un's first public appearance after weeks of speculation about his health. North Korean state media released the images of the opening of a fertilizer plant. Rumors had swirled after Kim missed celebrations of his country's biggest holiday on April 15th. Some reports suggested he was in grave danger after undergoing heart surgery. He was last seen in public three weeks ago. In the United States, Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden is denying an allegation of sexual assault. A former staffer says it happened in 1993 when Biden was a senator. Susan Ormiston has more from Washington and a warning. Some might find the description of the allegation disturbing. No, it is not true. I'm saying unequivocally, it never, never happened. Under pressure from even his own party, Joe Biden finally answered the allegation that in 1993 he assaulted a Senate aide. I don't remember any type of complaint she <clears throat> may have made. It was 27 years ago. Tara Reid worked for nine months in Biden's office. Decades passed, and then last month for the first time. We were alone, and it was the strangest thing. She detailed a moment in a hallway on Capitol Hill when she says Biden pressed her up against a wall. I remember the coldness of the wall, and I remember his hands underneath my blouse and underneath my skirt, and his fingers penetrating me as he was kiss trying to kiss me, and I was pulling away. Back then, her brother and a friend say she told them, but Senate staffers say there was no complaint from Reid or anyone else. But just last year, eight women, including Reid, accused Joe Biden of inappropriate touching. He acknowledged his tactile kind of politicking, but recognized the times have changed and so must he. Now, the likely Democratic nominee is forced to walk a fine line between standing up for women in a Me Too era, championed by liberals, and defending himself. Any woman, they should come forward. They should be heard. And then it should be investigated. Democratic senators Amy Klobuchar and Kamala Harris both defend Biden. And President Trump, who's waved off multiple sexual misconduct complaints, seems to relish his rival joining his messy circle. 
It could be false accusations. I know all about false accusations. There's no chance that Biden's defense will be the last word. Tara Reid is reportedly negotiating her first major TV interview, perhaps as soon as this weekend, with Fox Television. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. May Day protests took place across the United States today, but they looked a little different this year. They're not considering the people who have lost their jobs, their livelihood. This was a scene in Chicago as dozens of people defied a stay-at-home order and demanded an end to Illinois' COVID-19 restrictions. A counter-protest saw a caravan of cars supporting the measures but calling for further relief. And these nurses in California joined hundreds of others nationwide to demand more personal protective equipment. There were protests in New York today, too. Its governor has outlined a plan to reopen some low-risk businesses by mid-May. But the process will be gradual and slow. And for industries like entertainment and tourism, it could be a long time before anyone is back to work. Stephen D'Souza has that story. For Canadian Paul Nolan, Rolo Saskatchewan is a long way from Broadway. After his starring run in the New York production of Slave Play ended in January, and with TV and stage auditions shutting down, it was time to come home. I was in the middle of kind of uh, fishing for the for the big fish when uh, this all kind of came down and we jumped ship and came up to Saskatchewan. The curtains are closed on Broadway until at least June 7th. Unlike 9-11, when theaters reopened two days later to show the city's resilience, this time officials say events that draw big crowds will be among the last to reopen. If they told us today we could come back, we wouldn't be able to be back between four and six weeks because we'd have to get our cast back together, we'd have to go through rehearsals. The Broadway Trade Association says most shows can't afford to run in half-empty theaters, so they need social distancing rules eased and have safety measures in place to protect both the audience and performers. Tourists make up 65 percent of Broadway audiences, so the domino effect hits the city's hotels. Industry insiders say the key to bringing people back goes beyond testing and slowing new infections. The biggest challenge is if public health authorities are able to convince everybody that uh, you know it's safe to come back. New York hotels are discussing a rating system, like health grades at restaurants, to assure visitors it's safe. That'll be a you know signal to customers that hey, this hotel has done X Y Z uh, in terms of sanitation, in terms of social distancing, in terms of equipment, and so those are some of the things that uh, will bolster confidence. Back on the farm, Paul Nolan is looking at a long hiatus. I'll be lucky to be auditioning for anything seriously until the ne until next year. He says he'll be back because the show must go on eventually. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. Ahead tonight, culinary stars replace fine dining with home cooking. Mothers and, and fathers who have three, four, five children at home, they can't be fine straining their soup. Like They need to get the thing on the table. We look at how the celebrity cooking world is improvising during the pandemic. First, though, we'll put your questions to the financial experts, including how can I speak to my landlord about rent issues without putting myself in a position to possibly be evicted? The answer to that and more next. Welcome back. Time for your COVID questions. And tonight, we're focusing on a source of anxiety for a lot of people, finances. And while the questions are specific, I think there is a wider relevance to a lot of them. So let's bring in our two personal finance commentators, Rabina ahmed Huck and Preet Banerjee. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. And Rabina, let's start with you. Here's the question. How can I speak to my landlord about rent issues without putting myself in a position to possibly be evicted? Uh, well, there is no federal rent relief program for residential tenants right now. That really has been put on the provinces. So if you live in a province where there is some rent relief, you should be taking advantage of that if you are in some financial distress. Uh, most provinces and territories have put a moratorium on eviction, so you don't need to worry in the immediate term for that. Uh, but definitely the best advice I could give is speak to your landlord or your property management company. One property management company that I know here in Toronto has a COVID-19 
plan in place. They're allowing tenants to pay 50% of the rent now and 50% down the road when they get their job back. That helps the tenant out by not getting themselves in too much debt and helps the landlord out being able to pay their overhead costs like mortgage, utilities if they're responsible for it, and property taxes. And of course, here we are, May 1st, beginning of the month. So those conversations likely are going on right across the country. Uh, Preet, let, let's turn the focus slightly to uh, commercial rent. The question, how can the new commercial rent assistance program help my small business? What if it isn't enough? Yeah, great question. A lot of landlords and tenants have this exact question because the criteria to be eligible is pretty strict. The small business has to show a 70% decline in revenues. And if they qualify, they could get potentially 75% of their rent reduced. But it's actually the landlord that has to make the application. And the landlord themselves then also has to eat 25% of the normal rent. And the remainder gets covered by the funds provided by the government. So because it might be tough for some businesses to qualify, what you might be able to do is still negotiate directly with your landlord. That doesn't have to fall under the purview of any of these programs. You can negotiate. And similar to what Vina said, be proactive and talk to your landlord about what your options are. Maybe you can work out a special arrangement. All right, Rubina, here's a, a very specific question. I'm a single mom living in housing with no child support because the father was laid off. What are my options? Uh, so one of the options is to see if you qualify for the CERB. That would definitely help you out with $2,000 uh, up to 16 weeks in four week periods. Um, you can also see, because your problem is probably cash flow, so you can see what can you uh, defer. So that could be your mortgage, it could be speaking to your utility companies about deferring some of the payments or going on a payment plan. If you drive, take your car off of insurance. If you're not driving that vehicle right now, auto insurance companies are giving that break as well. So really dealing with immediate cash flow, prob cash flow problems is the first thing that you need to do and speak to, uh, um, uh, speak to you know the the fact that uh, there are benefits available for children, especially parents. There is that extra up to three hundred dollars per child that is coming uh, with the CCB, and that's automatic. If you already get the CCB, uh, you will be getting that uh, up to three hundred dollars in the May payments. Yeah, you know, there's a lot that's interesting there, including the car insurance thing. A lot of cars are sitting out front of houses or in garages, uh, not being used, right, and still paying insurance uh, on those. Uh, Next question, my maternity leave is coming to an end. Will I be able to get EI if I can't work because of COVID? Yeah, another common question. And the good news is, you know, if your maternity period ends and you're unable to find work, then you will fall under the category of someone who has stopped work due to COVID-19 and you would be eligible to apply for the CERB, which again pays the $2,000 per month. Uh, again, subject to the other criteria, which is, you know, you had income of 5,000 in 2019 and the other regular criteria for the CERB. All right, and Rubina, will this period of unemployment affect my chances of getting a mortgage in the future? Uh, when you go and apply for a mortgage, uh, the lender is going to look at your financial situation, how much debt you're in, how you've been able to make your uh, debt payments, whether that be on your credit card, your utility company. Uh, so if you are going into debt and missing payments, then absolutely it could affect your ability to get a mortgage. Also, if you've seen your income drop, that is going to affect your ability to get a mortgage. So all of the things happening now may not have a direct impact on your, on your credit score, but definitely when you go and apply for a mortgage, Mortgage, they are going to look at those factors before they lend you any money for a house purchase that you might want to make. Really nice hearing from both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, we continue to ask your questions about COVID-19 on the program. So send the questions you have. You can message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National or send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. Just put The National in the subject line. Next to pandemic pivot on the manufacturing line from car parts to face shields and later. What a way to make an exit. An emotional thank you and a round of applause after recovering from COVID-19. That is ahead tonight. First though, here's Andrew with tonight's pandemic how-to guide. We're told over and over again, don't touch your face. That's because the virus gets in through your nose, mouth, and eyes. But if you wear contacts, then you're touching both eyes at least twice a day. So 
should just stop. Now, eyes are a place where you could theoretically get inoculated with the virus. The way to protect against that concern is to actually wash your hands extremely well with soap and water for 20 seconds before handling your contacts and putting them in. So essentially, the advice is the same as it always has been. Yes, if you're touching your eyes, you should be washing your hands really well. But if you have the option of wearing glasses, should you? I will confess that I've been wearing my glasses more often when I'm at work because it does provide a measure of protection against droplets um, when you're in closer quarters. But if you're distancing, there's really no disadvantage to contacts. Just wash your hands. Hey there, I'm Jamie Campbell, host of Blue Jays Central. I've joined an amazing group of volunteers called Conquer COVID-19. I have a car here full of great stuff, protective equipment going to Northern Ontario. Sometimes I lie awake at night wondering if I'm doing enough to ensure the health of my own two children. I'm quite certain that I am at this point, but here's where I find hope. And maybe I'm instilling this in those two boys by showing them that the essence of being Canadian is that we are willing to help each other through a difficult period. Hey there, North Bay. I come bearing gifts. Thank you from North Bay. Canadians across the country have been mobilizing, like Jamie, to help during the pandemic. And some companies are also playing a part, retooling production lines to fill needs on the front lines. Nick Purden visited one Ontario factory to see how it's gone from making car parts to face shields. Time is of the essence, right? So there's a big sense of urgency here. Joe D'Angelo is using his factory to fight COVID-19. He spent his life building an auto parts business that employs 2,800 people across North America. Hey, guys. That's now on hold. Hey, thanks for coming in, man. Joe could have turned out the lights here, but he says the stakes are too high. We just want to have an impact, you know. I think our, our generation has had, had life so, so good for the longest time, for decades, and really this is almost like our World War III. Joe didn't wait. His company, Mitchell Plastics, started retooling their machines to build face shields instead of center consoles for cars before they even had someone to take them. And we just jumped on it, bought the materials and started making them before we had an order. So it's been a couple of weeks and we think the first shipment is going to go out today. The company isn't making money doing this. And what's more, all the people working here, like Danielle McLeod, they could have stayed home, but instead they volunteered. Well, all the doctors and nurses are out there every day struggling to keep us safe. So whatever little parts we can do to help them out is just amazing. Jaden Hamill is a safety manager at the plant. So normally, he doesn't go anywhere near the machines. It's cool to have work in an industry where we're able to retool so quickly to be able to produce something that's not normally a product of ours. Mitchell Plastics is on target to deliver around half a million face shields to frontline workers. Now Joe's got his engineers working on how to mass produce test swabs. But it's not just Mitchell Plastics in Kitchener, Ontario that's joined the fight against COVID. It's a lot bigger than that. I've called it the largest peacetime mobilization of Canada's industrial capacity. It is um, hundreds of companies, th yeah, thousands of factories. That's Flavio Volpe, president of the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association. We're just like in World War II when we were making planes and boats and guns. During a pandemic, the people who are on the front lines need things to get between them and the enemy. I get emails and messages from frontline workers who are in tears. And, uh, you know, they read the news and they say, you know, we're, we're there to serve and we're going to show up to work, but we're, we're in danger. Can you help? Volpe says working to protect against COVID is one of the most rewarding things he's ever done. And it's thanks to people like Joe and his staff. Of course, everyone here is eager for the day things return to normal and they're making car parts again. Usually the, this plant's coming, you know, there's, there's a buzz. It, you can just feel it being very productive. It's full of people, you know, working hard, and it, yeah, it's kind of heartbreaking. Making the face shields uh, gives us a glimmer of hope in an otherwise very bad situation. Nick Purden, CBC News, Kitchener, Ontario. Some of the biggest names in the culinary world have also had to pivot since the pandemic started. 
Hi guys, welcome to Show Me What You're Working With. Next on the National Cooking at Home with Celebrity Chefs and how the way we dine is changing. Foodies forced to stay home because of the pandemic are cooking up a storm. And they're getting inspired by celebrity chefs sharing their wisdom on social media. Eli Glasner serves this one up. Quarai, cooking lessons in quarantine, episode five. Cooped up chicken. Every night now on Instagram, celebrity chefs are mixing cocktails. Just what everybody needs, right? And conducting cooking classes. We're going to add more cheese. Welcome. Like many, Chef Dev Rajkumar is focusing on food that makes you feel good. Working from his parents' kitchen, he's modifying his approach. There's a lot of people out there, the mothers and, and, and fathers who have three, four, five children at home. They can't be fine straining their soup. Like they need to get the thing on the table, right? <laughs> a little tablespoon. As the COVID crisis continues, cooking channels are now whipping up new quarantine inspired content. Hi guys, welcome to Show Me What You're Working With. Like this new show where Canadian Queer Eye food expert Anthony Paraski creates recipes with what a viewer has on hand. Onions, basil, garlic. Wait, what was the wild card? Korean hot pepper paste. While many food fans are looking forward to returning to restaurants when the pandemic subsides, this Iron Chef competitor says dining out will change dramatically. We have the idea of the restaurant and conviviality and large format and large tables, large groups. Everything is going, going to go to the wayside, I'd say, for the next two years. Welcome to Monogram Kitchen Stadium. Canadian top chef Gail Simmons has gone from judging fine dining to competing against the chaos at home. This is my real kitchen behind me. <laughs> and it is a quick fire challenge every day. But as someone who lived in New York City through 9-11, she believes the industry will adapt. We will pivot. Takeout and delivery will be stronger than ever. And, you know, the way that we share food will become different, perhaps. The way that chefs cook and what they cook, I think will be more in tune with the way we all need to feed ourselves, nourish ourselves. And then until then, she's serving up dollops of comfort, one recipe at a time. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Yep, hungry now. Next on The National, some good news. A patient who tested positive for COVID-19 at an Alberta hospital gets to go home. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> There's a great story behind this homecoming. It's next in our moment. Colette Sevigny is finally back with her daughter Louise after a long five weeks battling COVID-19 in an Alberta hospital. Yesterday, the 80-year-old got a homecoming filled with gratitude and celebration. And that is our moment. When I picked, went to pick mom up, the transition coordinator said, we might just be a few minutes because we want to give your mother a really nice send off because she is the first person to leave our unit that tested COVID positive. Got such a send off. It was unbelievable. But yeah, after being there for five weeks, I got, they were like family. You know what? Our family cannot thank you enough. Every single person in this hallway, you guys have cared and loved for mom when we couldn't be here. You're a family. Thank you. They looked and I can't, wall to wall staff on both sides. And right by the desk was my sweet little mother, <laughs> smiling and waving. I, none of us thought three weeks ago that would be the case. So she had a fractured pelvis, she had pneumonia, she had COVID-19, and as you heard a few weeks ago, the prognosis was not looking very good, but uh, she told our producer Eliza that her husband had died back in January and she didn't want her family to lose another parent, another grandparent, and so she decided to make sure she would pull through. She did, and what a marvel for her family and clearly all the people on that floor. That is The National for May the 1st. Good night.